rooted. It means to be established firmly. A rooted life speaks of health, connection, and purpose. And those things aren't possible without a firm foundation. Deep-rooted growth allows vitality and can support abundance. Colossians 2.7 Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Good morning for another four minutes, still morning. Wow, it's great to start the week with you here at People's Church. You have come, we've worshiped, and now we're ready to hear the word of the Lord this morning. I invite you to get your notes and your Bibles ready as you're doing that. This was a great week for our community as in downtown Salem, in the heart of our city. We dedicated the brand new with Nell Family YMCA campus. And as part of that dedication, I want to show you something that happened that was part of the dedication of our new YMCA. Uh, when we were gathered there, look at this. Uh, a prayer in the name of Jesus, hands extended over that campus, that this new YMCA will be a light to our city. And I appreciate that the leaders of our local Y have said, we want to keep the C, which stands for Christ, we want to keep the C in YMCA. A conversation I remember and I overheard years ago reminded me that anything that you say publicly in front of a pastor may end up as a future sermon illustration. So I overheard this dad speaking and he was saying how he does not go to church, but he said, I might go to church if I could get into the service without having to talk to anybody in the lobby, if I could go through the service without having to be uh, pressured to serve in the nursery or to attend a potluck, and if I could leave the service without having to talk to anybody on the way back out. There are are people who are in your life, if you are a regular part of worship services, there are people in your life who do not understand why you do what you do. They do not understand why we do what we do. Now, you come in a little bit later if you're just starting with us at 1130, but for those who get up at 830, and even if you're coming in later, they're in their pajamas, and they're wondering, why does my neighbor get leave every Sunday morning? Why does my neighbor forego playing golf on Sunday to attend church? Uh, why would they miss the early NFL games to be in church? That is something that, uh, you know, in the, when we lived in central time zone and eastern time zone, the football games don't start until after church is over. So here on the West Coast, football fans, you pay a greater sacrifice to be part of what God is doing. There are others who would say that they are followers of Christ, but they have decided through whatever set of circumstances that this is something that I'm going to do on my own. I don't need the faith community, they would say. I, I'm a follower of Christ. I do church by myself in my house, and I don't need the gathering in a building with other people peace. So it's on this that we begin our brand new four-week series called Rooted. Rooted. If you're here for the very first time, you're here on a great week because we're starting something brand new today. Rooted, Rooted is all about the strength that comes when we connect our personal faith journey to our connection to a local church. Some of you are in a very different place from that dad who desired to get in and get out without being detected. You are saying, I want to take the next step of engagement with my local church. I want to be more involved. I want to know the path on how to do it. 
Rooted is a message series that we are going to go through all together as a church family. And when we're done after these four weeks, Rooted is going to live on as the onboarding path for those who are new and want to plug into church life, those who want to serve, and those who would like the option of becoming a member of the church. And when you're a member, it gives you a voice and a vote in our biggest decisions. So let me give you a quick overview of the next few weeks. Today, we're introducing the concept of what it means to live a rooted life. Next week, September 25th, session one, believe. Session two, belong, is October 22nd. And it's a two-for-one on October 9th. Uh, session number three is highly interactive. And we could not find a way to adequately do this all together in the sanctuary. So because that session is so... Uh, leans so heavily on inter interaction, that day we will be offering session three in our conference center at the same time that we are offering session four in the sanctuary. So the idea would be if you come at 1130, typically you would go to session three in the conference center and then come here right after, or you could attend 10 o'clock here in the sanctuary and then go to the conference rooms at 1130. And our ask is for everyone who is currently serving or who desires to serve to go through Rooted. And if you come next week, we have a special gift for you. Uh, we have a team that has been for many months working on compiling a guidebook that will be our guide through the Rooted series. So PC Kids leaders, PC Youth leaders, hosts, parking lot, tech team, worship team, security team, Greeters, girls ministries leaders, Royal Ranger leaders, anywhere that you may wear a lanyard on our campus with your name on it, we want you to go through Rooted because, 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 because something incredible happens when we serve and we're all on the same page, when we're all working from the same foundation, and that is at the heart of what Rooted is. And the good news is that you're here today. You didn't even know you were coming to this, and here you are, and you've already got one week down. If it is your desire to go through Rooted and at the end be ready to serve in an area of the church, this is what we're asking you to do. We have a check-in station that is right outside these doors. And after we're done in here today, we simply would ask that you would check in today and for the next four weeks so that we know that you went through Rooted and you are ready to serve. After we get done with doing this as a, as a church family all together, Rooted will be offered in a small group format for those who are ready to take the next step of church engagement. Today we want to look at a verse from Colossians that is our foundation verse for this series. And then we're going to hang out in a psalm in the Old Testament for a little bit. And what we're going to see today is that there is a difference between going to church and being part of the church. There's a difference between going to church and being part of the church. If you are a follower of Christ, what God has called us to, our lifelong pursuit is to become more like Jesus every day. Our lifelong pursuit as followers of Christ is to be more like Jesus today than we were yesterday, to be more like Jesus tomorrow than we are today. And if you would say in a moment of honesty that actually progressively, you say I'm a follower of Christ, but over the last weeks, months, or years, I actually have becoming I've been becoming less and less like Jesus Christ. That's called backsliding. And there's no better day than today than to reset and to refocus on committing each and every day to becoming more like Jesus. What we'll see is that in our pursuit of becoming more like Jesus, yes, we absolutely need that solo, alone, one-on-one -on -one time with our Heavenly Father in personal Bible reading, personal devotions, personal prayer, allowing the Holy Spirit to bring the Word of God to life, and also, and also, not either or, and also, it's God's idea, it's God's idea that life pursuing Christ will happen in community with other believers. So the foundation verse of this series is Colossians 2, verse 7. Colossians 2, verse 7, let your roots grow down into him. And let your lives be built on him. Let your roots grow down into Jesus. And let your lives be built on Jesus. Then, what's the result? Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught. 
and you will overflow with thankfulness. Let your roots grow down into Christ. Let your lives be built on him. In this illustration, Jesus Christ is the soil and you are the plant. You will grow strong in the truth you were taught, Paul writes. You will overflow with thankfulness. This is so good because Paul, writing to the church in Colossae then and to us now, tells us what to do and the results, what we can expect. The result, strength in the truth, overflowing with gratitude. And so one of the questions to wrestle with today, do you want to be strong? Do you want to be strong not in opinions? Do you want to be strong not in whatever culture is, happens to be approving today? Do you want to be strong in the truth, in alignment with the teachings of Jesus Christ and the word of God that we find in the Bible, that truth? How about this? Do you want a life overflowing, overflowing, overflowing with gratitude? The path to get there is roots in Christ. A life built on Jesus, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. So much of this is our individual commitment to reading the Bible, allowing the Holy Spirit to bring life to God's word, steadfast, consistent prayer. So what's the why? What's, what's the, why is it so important why is strength in the truth so valuable? Why is strength in God's truth even essential? Here's why. Because so much in 2022, West Coast America, so much is coming against the truth. The truth of God is under assault. Where God's word is clear, the enemy wants to bring confusion. And don't miss this. Knowing the truth Knowing the truth equips you to identify the confusion. Knowing the truth equips you to see the deception when it comes at you. Some of you have tried the choose your own truth. Some of you have tried the make your own truth. Live your own truth. Only to realize that a life built on a self-centered truth, which isn't really truth, life built on self ultimately leads to emptiness, regret, loneliness, and lack of purpose. Many of you would be here today and you would say, I've been following Jesus for a long time. I know the truth. I know what Jesus teaches. I know what the Bible says. And you would say, there are moments when I feel discouraged. There are moments you feel discouraged because it appears like the deception and the confusion is succeeding. It feels like the deception and confusion is winning. You see things like influencers, going around parents through schools and through screens to shape the minds of the next generation outside of parental leadership. You see things like the devaluing of life. You see things like vandalism and violence, gender confusion, identity confusion. You see things like those who take advantage of the vulnerable for personal gain. You see what is good being called out as evil and you, seeing, you see what is evil being held up as good. And there are times you feel discouraged. What if I told you that frustration over wickedness and evil appearing to succeed, frustration over that, it's actually nothing new. It's been happening for thousands of years. We can see in the Old Testament writings going back 3,000 years and more, cries out to God like Psalm 73, 2, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. We see raw, real questions in the Bible. God, why are you allowing evil and wickedness to succeed while the truth is trashed and good and good people seem to suffer? Why, God? If you have felt that way, you'd have something in common with the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 12.1, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? If you've had a question if you've struggled and wrestled like Jeremiah, how would God respond? 
How would God respond? Look at Psalm 92, verse 7, and we can read this as a response to questions like that. Psalm 92, 7. Though the wicked sprout like weeds and evildoers flourish, they will be destroyed forever. Though the wicked sprout like weeds and evildoers flourish, they will be destroyed forever. This one verse resets our perspective on the success of evil, the success of wickedness, when it seems like confusion seems to be winning the day. This takes us from a short-range view to a long-range view, because evil may succeed for a season, but whatever is against God will ultimately fail. Think about weeds. Think about weeds. I have a picture, and I promise you I did not go around to try to find uh, the home of a church member to take a picture of your yard. Weeds can grow rapidly. Weeds can take a lot of ground in a hurry. Weeds can grow tall and thick, but no matter how tall, no matter how thick weeds grow, in God's view, they are useful for next to nothing. Weeds do not produce food. Weeds do not produce fruits and vegetables. Weeds cannot be used to construct anything. Weeds make awful building materials. Wicked, evil, confusion, deception, these things may produce results that are praised by people and culture, but the weeds are not producing anything that is God honoring. God is not accomplishing his purposes on this planet through deception, confusion, and evil. Evil and wickedness, in God's view, are like dead grass and weeds, useless, no value. So what does this mean for us today? If you are living in a way that is opposed to God's ways, if you are representing, if you are advancing, if you are leading plans that run in opposition to God's ways, you need to know Eventually, the time is going to run out. Eventually, God's patience will run out. Eventually, God's patience will end. And also, no matter how deeply entangled you are in the weeds of what is against God, God loved you so much and loves you so much that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you. And if you would be here today challenged in your spirit because you would say, I've been living my life against God's ways. I have represented things and I have advanced plans that are clearly evil and opposed to God. You have the choice to say, I'm not going to take one step further in that direction. You can make the decision to repent. And the word repent simply means to turn away from what is against God and turn toward a loving Heavenly Father who is waiting with open arms to receive you and forgive you, not by your own good works, but through grace and mercy and forgiveness and the blood shed by Jesus Christ on that cross. Because when Jesus Christ defeated death, he defeated it for all who would receive him and follow him as a free will offering. All right. Maybe you've liked the first part of the message. We're about to get to my favorite part of today. Maybe you've actually been looking at the new screen or the lights or something. I promise you, you don't want to miss the next part. If wickedness and evil and sin are like weeds and dead grass, what about those who are following Christ? What does the Bible say about those who are under God's covering, who are desiring to live a life under the covering of the Heavenly Father? Look at Psalm 92, verse 12. This is so good. But the godly, the godly will flourish like palm trees and grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. Here, those who are living life 
running after God under the covering of our Heavenly Father, living life pursuing Christ, God's Word compares us not to one tree, but two types of trees, the palm tree and the cedars of Lebanon. Maybe you know something about these trees. What I will assure you is that when you know more about these trees, the connection to life following God and how why God would use these as an illustration is so powerful. Let's talk about the Lebanon cedar. Lebanon today is a tiny country in the Middle East. Cedar trees that grow in this region were and continue to be highly sought after. These trees produce an incredibly durable wood. These cedars, the way God designed them, actually resist decay in an incredible way. And they even resist tiny insect pests. Wow. This is also, oh, this is good. The cedar of Lebanon, these trees are also strongly, highly desired because they have a very attractive smell. Go ahead and smell the person next to you. No, just kidding. <laughs> the cedars of Lebanon have a very attractive aroma. And when I learned that about the cedar of Lebanon, it reminded me of what it says in 2 Corinthians 2.15. For we, this is Christians, followers of Christ, for we as followers of Christ are the aroma of Christ to God. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. A cedar of Lebanon can live for more than a thousand years. If you want to right now, you could Google Maps where Lebanon is. And you don't have to know much about the region of where that country is in the Middle East. But this is a nation, this is an area, a region that has been overwhelmed by wars and conflict over the years, over the centuries. This is a region that has faced incredible natural disasters, long-standing droughts, devastating droughts, conflict internal and external, yet the cedars of Lebanon survive. The cedars of Lebanon remain. When the Bible, in the Old Testament and New Testament, when we see references to palm trees, most often it is referencing the date palm tree. The date palm tree, which is very uh, common in this Middle East region. The date palm is essential to life in the region where these trees grow. Every part of the date palm is useful. The leaves of the date palm over the centuries have been used for roofing and siding on homes. The leaves are so sturdy that they have been used to build fences to keep out the winds and to keep out wild animals. The top of the date palm can be removed and used to make ropes. The date kernels provide food for animals, particularly camels. Even the seeds of the date palm have been used as beads for jewelry. And what I've just said about all these different uses of the date palm are uses that can happen over and over and over again. You don't have to cut the tree down to get these results. It's a tree that is useful year after year after year. I really appreciate our amazing tech team and creative team that we have at the church, especially when I send them pictures just before service starts and say, could we please get this on the screen? So I sent them a picture of hurricane damage just moments before our first service today, and I appreciate that they turned this around. Look at this. When a powerful hurricane hit this community in the Caribbean, everything that is built by man is either damaged or destroyed. But church, look what remains standing. Look what remains standing. 
Do you see the palm trees? Do you see the palm trees? Maybe you can think of watching one of those silly reporters during a natural disaster standing out in the hurricane force winds and what are the palm trees doing? They're bending. God designed the palm tree to bend but not break. God designed the palm tree to survive even when facing hurricane force extreme winds. And God, in his word, says, as a child, a son or a daughter of mine, you are like the palm tree. Hurricane force winds of culture and confusion may blow against you. You may bend, but you will not break. After our first service this morning, a lady came up to me and she was uh, telling me about flying into the island of Guam after a natural disaster. And across the island, many of the buildings had been destroyed. But yet, still standing, what looked like toothpicks from high in the air, as they became closer, it was clear that what was still standing were the palm trees. The palm trees were still standing. Now, she said many of them had lost their leaves, but the trunks were still standing. And what's so powerful, yes, the branches may have been destroyed for a moment, but as a living palm tree, the fruit will come back again. The branches will come back again. And maybe you've been in a place where emotionally, spiritually, some way you feel like you have been beat up. You've been through it. And you are not producing in your life the spiritual fruit that you once enjoyed. And God may be saying, you may be like that palm tree that has survived the storm and your leaves are gone. But God is saying, stay rooted. Stay close. You will produce fruit again. Stay rooted. Stay close. God's not done with you. You will produce fruit again. God has more for you in this life. How encouraging is this? When we feel discouraged and it feels like the evil and the confusion is winning, our Father in heaven, he sees that and he says, weed, weed, weed. The time is running out. It will not last. And yet if you are a child of God, he looks at you and he says, you are like a cedar of Lebanon. You are like a rooted palm tree and you will survive. You will thrive because why? Roots produce resilience. Roots produce strength. And roots produce usefulness. Psalm 92, verse 13. For they, speaking about people who are followers of Christ, who are children of God, for they are transplanted, transplanted to the Lord's own house. They flourish in the courts of our God. Godly people will flourish under his covering. So you and I, we have a choice, and it's an ongoing choice that we make. Are we, are we going to desire to flourish under whatever culture happens to be approving today? Or is it our desire to flourish in the courts of our Lord, to flourish under what God says is good? Culture's approval may come quickly and may appear good for a moment, but if in the end, if it's against God, it will come to an end. It's so good how the New Living Translation uses the word transplanted. Transplanted. Many of you would say it is your life story, like mine, where once you were living entangled in the weeds of sin and destruction and rebellion against God's ways, and your heavenly Father is so good, he transplanted you. He transplanted you. And he moved you out of what is against him through the blood of Jesus Christ, and he transplanted you into his kingdom. And you are now a son of God. You are now a daughter of God, redeemed and restored by the blood of Jesus Christ. Is anyone awake at 1224? Verse 14, even in old age... 
We don't have any old people here. But when you get old, whenever you get there, even in old age, God's people will still produce fruit. I'm not saying that. This is what the word says. Even in old age, God's people will still produce fruit. They will remain vital. Vital. You catch that word? Critical. Even in old age, you are vital, essential to God's purposes. Even in old age, God's people will still produce fruit. They will remain vital and green. While weeds are here today, gone tomorrow, short-range view, palm trees and the cedars of Lebanon are pictures of the long-range view. The cedar of Lebanon can live for more than a 1,000 years. The palm tree, it can take 30 years before it produces useful fruit. Yet then it can live to be more than 200 years old. God has a purpose for us in every life season. I felt challenged in my heart to share this with you today. We have amazing single parents in our church. You have single parents in your neighborhoods, in your workplaces. Some single parents, they may say, I've got this all on my own. Praise God if that's you. We also know that there are many, many single moms and single dads, and it's a struggle. And they are desperately longing for spiritual parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents to come alongside single mothers of sons who are longing for a man who loves Jesus to come alongside and to be a spiritual parent spiritual dad, spiritual grandpa, spiritual great-grandparent. We have single dads raising daughters who are longing for women who love Jesus, a woman who loves Jesus to come alongside their daughter and to be a spiritual mom, grandma, or great-grandmother. Every week on Wednesday nights, we have Royal Rangers, which is like a scouting program for boys and young men. We have girls' ministries for elementary age girls. Imagine the impact, the multiplying impact that you could possibly have if you'd be willing to say yes. Yes, I will speak life into a young man. Yes, I would be willing to be an encourager of a young girl. And maybe you're saying, I can't do that. I don't know the curriculum. I'm not sure I want to wear that uniform, whatever. We're simply looking for people who are willing to stand in the gap and to be a spiritual parent, a spiritual grandparent, or spiritual great-grandparent. And if you said to our kids pastors, Rob and Stephanie Bennett, if you said, I don't know what you need, but I'd be willing to come on Wednesday nights, and I would be willing to speak life into young people. They will use you. And you may be the one who is most blessed out of all of it as you watch your words of encouragement work in the life of the next generation. We've seen as we've talked today about how God values our personal faith journey of becoming rooted in Christ, of standing on Christ. And we also see woven through God's word how God highly values the gathering together of followers of Christ. There is a phrase that we find repeated in Paul's letters to start up churches in the first century. The phrase is this, the church that meets. The church that meets. Let's say that together. The church that meets. Romans 16, Paul is writing about his friends, a couple, Priscilla and Aquila. He calls them co-workers in the ministry of Jesus Christ. He talks about how Priscilla and Aquila once risked their lives for him. He says, I'm thankful for, for Priscilla and Aquila in Romans 16, 5, and give my greetings to the church that meets in their home. Give my greetings to the church that meets. Colossians 4, verse 15. Paul says, please give my greetings to our brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church that meets, the church that meets in her house. 
Paul writes a letter to his friend Philemon. We have it in our Bible. It's called Philemon. And once again, Paul writes to his friend and he says, uh, extends greetings and talks about who he's with. And he says, give my, my greetings, give my best, Philemon too, to the church that meets in your house. Be part of a church that meets. Be part of a church that gathers together. Following Christ is incomplete without community. Following Christ is incomplete without community. We miss out if personal commitment or community are missing from our faith journey. It's God's plan that we would have both, both personal commitment and community as we pursue Christ. Some of you might say, I'm very committed to my personal devotions, and I viewed being part of the faith community as optional, something I do here and there when I feel up to it. There are others who would say, I really love coming together with my church family. I'm all in. Yet you would say that your personal devotion time is not where it should be. And what we're saying today is that it's not either or, it's both and. It's personal devotions. And also, it's gathering together in community. Why would we settle for less than the best that God has to offer and the best that God has planned for us? In our closing moments together, we've talked about Priscilla and Aquila, the church that meets in their house. We've talked about Nympha, and the church that meets in her house. We've read about Philemon and the church that meets in his house. We love our church family. It gathers here. But let me ask you, what about the church that meets in your house? A church at its core is a gathering of believers. And we believe the church begins at home. The most important discipleship is intended to occur under your own roof. We come alongside to supplement and support when we're all here together, but we're missing out if devotions and time in the Word together with those under your own roof, if those things are missing. So we are praying over the next four Sundays, beginning today, We've paused our Sunday evening worship services. And some of you weren't coming to Sunday evenings to begin with. That's okay. But those of us who have been part of Sunday evenings, it's like, okay, what do we do now? We are asking our church family to start or restart using Sunday evenings. If you don't already have a, a good rhythm, to use Sunday evenings to start or restart or build upon spiritual disciplines that are happening in your own home. And let me give you a few ways that you can do this, a few ideas. We haven't given one prescribed path because there are many different ideas. One idea is Bible Engagement Project Family Devotions. Bible Engagement Project helps the Word of God come to life through discussion questions and through reading the Bible together. And we have uh, prepared printouts of a month's worth of family devotions. I said this morning to our team that we would give some ideas out there and we weren't quite sure what would catch. And so we made 80 copies of the Bible Engagement Project family devotions to give away. And uh, they told me between services, we ran out. So through this service, we've been printing more. And you can use these devotions as a guide in your own home for family devotions. One of the great ways that we have discipleship in our own home is through junior Bible quiz. And when it comes to junior Bible quiz in our house, Jennifer is the head coach. Usually I try to help the other kids stay out of the way as Jennifer is coaching one of the children in their junior Bible quiz questions. Junior Bible quiz teaches the word of God through a healthy competition model. Junior Bible Quiz meets every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock 
for grades uh, kindergarten through sixth grade. And each week when they come, they get a packet to take home of Bible quiz questions. And do you know what we've heard from one family after another, from moms and dads and grandparents who help their kids learn the questions during the week? Moms and dads and grandparents tell us we learn just as much as not more from practicing the junior Bible quiz questions as our kids do. And this is a fun way to bring the Word of God home to your personal discipleship in your house, your family discipleship. You can take the questions, you can learn the questions together. And some families have told us what they like to do is pick a few questions each week and in addition to learning the right answer to the questions, to going together, to looking up that story or that account in the Bible and reading it together to see the story behind the question. So Junior Bible Quiz is a church at home idea. Another resource that we provide to you for free, this is for anyone, even if this is the only time you ever come to this church. Right Now Media. Right Now Media is an online library of video Bible studies. A lot of us are familiar with Netflix or Hulu or Disney Plus, although if you're a subscriber to any of those, it's getting harder and harder to give them any of your money. Like three people agreed with me. Um, <laughs> But we understand the concept of an online video service where we, we purchase a subscription and we have access to all the video content. Well, Right Now Media is very similar, except we have paid for everyone's subscription and also all the content on there is encouraging to your faith. There are series that will take you through books of the Bible where each video is five or 10 minutes long and then there's discussion questions at the end. There's video Bible studies on parenting, on marriage, on walking through life after a marriage breakdown. There are, there's content on Right Now Media that is for kids to watch. And unless there's something we haven't seen yet, we believe that you can hand a tablet to your kids with the content on Right Now Media and be fully assured that they're not going to be pointed in the wrong direction. So maybe you look up a Right Now Media video series and you say, we're going to go through this as a family together. We're going to watch one video uh, a week on Sunday nights, and then we're going to talk about it together. And the last idea is to do a message discussion. I see many of you are busy throughout this message writing notes on the sermon. What a great idea to pull together those who are in your household, maybe a few friends, and uh, talk about whatever was preached about on Sunday morning. I heard uh, one couple that says we don't have kids in the house and so we have reached out to a few other singles and couples and we're gonna get together on Sunday nights for the next, for tonight and the next four weeks and we're gonna have a Bible study together. We're gonna pray together. You can do that. Maybe you'd say I, I'm newer in my faith but God has given me the gift of hospitality so you invite someone who knows the word, maybe at a greater level, you say, I'll provide the space, I'll make some pigs in a blanket and some lemonade. We'll invite a few people over and we'll study the word together, pray together and have some laughs together. Maybe there's another family that's, maybe you're established, you'd say I'm rooted in, in this church and you've met a, a family that's new or newer what a great idea to say, why don't, would you be willing to come over to my house tonight? We have uh, family friends uh, in Wisconsin, and the mom, wife of this family, she uh, has become famous for inviting people to church, from church to her house the day that she meets them. And sometimes, candidly, it seems to frustrate her husband because they're about to leave, and she'll say, I've invited some people to come over to our house right now. When did you meet them? About five minutes ago. When we're open, God can do amazing things through us to build community. Through the Holy Spirit, God has been speaking to each of us in different ways. Some of us, God has been speaking to us about transplanting all of our life or some of our life that's been entangled in the weeds, transplanting that and moving our full life 
into the house of the Lord. Some of us, God has been challenging to increase our personal devotion time, to take it from the occasional to the, to the daily. Some of us, God has been challenging to go from church attender to being part of the church, from watching other people serve to taking that step of serving. And some of you, you'd say rooted is exactly what I've been waiting for. I've wanted to get involved. I've not been sure how to do it. And rooted is your path to take that step into serving at, at another level, to restarting or serving for the first time. Over the years, I've heard the phrase something like, well, I was involved in those kids' areas when my kids were involved, but now my kids are grown and it's someone else's turn. I'm just saying, maybe it's possible that God has given you a sabbatical, but he may be calling you now out of retirement. He may be calling you out of retirement to return to being a spiritual parent or grandparent. Maybe you were a spiritual parent, now a spiritual grandparent. Maybe now it's spiritual great-grandparent. And God wants to once again use you in that kid's area that you thought was in your past. We need spiritual parents, spiritual grandparents to step up. God may be calling you today. I believe that in the coming weeks and months, we are going to see intergenerational come to life in this church like we've never seen it before. We've talked about the difference between multi-generational and intergenerational. Multi-generational says we have something for everyone. Intergenerational says we are a church that believes in ways to bring the generations together. And one of the ways that this happens is on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings in our kids' areas and in our youth areas. Okay, I think I've pounded that enough. I'm, thank you for indulging me. I don't know. That was for someone today. Someone's like, I wish she would stop talking about that. And if you're feeling burdened, it's not because of me, it's the Holy Spirit. I see a lot of families around today, a lot of kids coming into church. Jennifer and I, we would love to see every child grade kindergarten through sixth grade. And I know you get a sixth grade, you're like a teenager, preteen, we would love to see every kindergartner through sixth grade in our kids musical for Christmas this year. The first rehearsal is coming up this Wednesday night. Through rehearsals for this musical, your kids will learn truth from the Bible. They will learn leadership and confidence as they learn the songs and the motions and some of them will have speaking roles. Your children will build community and build relationship with other boys and girls. And you might just get to meet a few new parents as you bring your kids to be part of the kids' musical. And we're going to present it on Chris, uh, Sunday during December. It's the Christmas uh, kids' Christmas musical. It feels like it's a long way off, but it's only like 10 weeks, 12 weeks. So we would love to see every kid who calls People's Church their church home uh, in the production. We've also heard of, of families who have neighbor friends or friends in school and they're not maybe the neighbor family isn't quite ready to come to church but they are willing to send their kids to be here on Wednesday night to be in the musical production you can say you know what I'll, I'll, I'll bring them with us we already got six in the minivan what's one more make sure everyone has a seatbelt can I invite you to stand with me in this place We see the signs of the times. Many of you have spiritual eyes because you know the word. You see the deception, you see the evil. And there can be times when it feels like we just wanna go sit in the corner in the fetal position. I'm just gonna wait here until Jesus comes back. I'm just gonna wait here I'm gonna be in my little cocoon. I'm only gonna surround myself with believers. 
not just believers. I'm only going to surround myself with believers who agree in exactly the same theology as I agree. I, I have. I'm just going to huddle here. Jesus, anytime. I don't believe that's the life that God has called us to. If you're reading the same Bible I'm reading, God has called us to be a cedar of Lebanon. God, God has called us to be a palm tree that can withstand hurricane force winds. Praise God. Because I'm taller, this happens to a lot of taller people. Our, we, we tend to slouch a lot so we can talk to the rest of you. My chiropractor says I need to work on my posture. And he says, you can do this. You can try it with me right now. He says, roll your shoulders back. Roll your soldiers ba shoulders back. And it's not so you can look like a Hollywood lifeguard, although it helps. Roll your shoulders back. Stand tall. Stand proud. You are not a weed. You are not useless. Maybe you've never been called a tree before, but today you are a cedar of Lebanon. If you are a follower of Christ, you are a palm tree. You are a cedar of Lebanon. Come on, church. You are a palm tree. You are a cedar of Lebanon. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, challenged by your word today. Father, help us to see things the way that you see them. Help us to identify the confusion. Help us to stand up when you call us to stand up. Challenge us to live out the Christian walk that you've designed. A life with personal commitment and devotion. Coupled in strength with life in a Christ-following community. Help us to step out of whatever cultural weeds may have entangled us that are keeping us from all that you want us to be. Show us what it means to be a palm tree with the strength to withstand whatever may come against us, not because of how great we are or how strong we are. Help us to be a cedar of Lebanon because of how deep our roots in Christ grow. We want to be deeply rooted. We want to be deeply rooted. We want to be transplanted out of the evil, out of rebellion, out of sin. We want to be transplanted out of that and planted to stay, to never be moved from the soil that is Jesus Christ. Thank you for challenging us through your word today. Thank you for encouraging us. We're not here to hide and wait. We're here to stand up and proclaim there is a better way. There is hope. There is restoration. There is new life. And it comes through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Thank you.
powerful message today. I, I love visuals. I love the vision of the palm tree in the hurricane. And I believe our church has withstood hurricane force winds in the last couple of years. And we stood strong because we were rooted. And we were able to open our doors when a lot of churches did not open their doors. And I'm so grateful that first Sunday when we walked through those doors and we were able to come back in and be community, be together, because that's how God designed us to be. What an amazing day that was. And every day since, we, we took for granted what we had. I, the other vision that I got when we were, picture that I had was Monday night, Jay Greer, one of our founding members, 92, 93 years old. He's not old though, right? I think Pastor Tom said we weren't old. Nobody in here is old. I wrote that one down. <laughs> but Jay Greer standing here praying over one of our youth, one, <clears throat> over Tucker. Because in, I, I just, I love that picture of generation to generation to generation. Rooted. And what that means in Tucker's life, having someone rooted in his faith, praying over him, going out beyond these walls. God's got a call on that young man's life. And Jay's been a part of that and praying for him and speaking over him. How grateful we are to be a part of the body of God. I promise you that if you do not have an area to serve, we have hundreds of them. And you know, Wes and I, through the years we've served and all the kids' ministries coming up, and our boys now all into college, but I'm not old, remember that. Now, so now where's our next area to serve, right? We keep looking, we're, we're gonna stay involved. So it's a challenge for all of us. Where's our next area to serve? I promise if you don't have one, come find us. We'll, we'll put you in. There's so many great areas and it takes all of us. It takes all the, whole, all the parts of the palm tree together. That's how we stand strong is together. If you are interested, if your kids are interested in being involved in the kids' musical, when you go to check out your kids at the kids' center out there, ask them. They will let you know uh, how to get, get your kids involved. It's going to be an amazing musical. And then the best part of that is not only do we get to see all the kids looking very cute, you get to invite people that might not otherwise come to church, but they'll come see their child or their grandchild or their neighbor kid come so it's a great opportunity to invite those god today as we go out i pray father that your spirit would speak to us lord that you would impart wisdom lord and, and you would give us guidance and show us in the areas that you want us to serve in next lord as we try to take ministry outside of these walls of the church lord that you will go with us today that we'll be intentional in our times this evening and i pray father that you would give everyone here a great day. You would bless them, Lord. And we ask, the, ask all these things in your name. Come back Wednesday night. It's our first Wednesday night back in the sanctuary for prayer nights. It's going to be a powerful, powerful evening. And we look forward to seeing all of you.